Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, and I'm afraid my old man problems of gout are still here. I can't even get my foot in a pair of sliders right now, but thankfully my voice is okay and my spirits remain high. So on with today's show. And did you know that most AI breakthroughs are driven by deep learning? However, current models and deployment methods suffer significant limitations. And by that, I mean large energy and memory consumption, high costs and hyper-specific hardware. But Hardware advancements have gotten deep learning deployments this far, and it's AI that's required to help it meet the full potential of a software accelerator approach. So Dr. Eli David is a pioneering researcher in deep learning and neural networks, and he's focused his research on the development of deep learning technologies that improve real world deployment of AI systems. And he believes the key lies in the software. So bringing his research to fruition, Eli has developed DeepCube, a software-based inference accelerator that can be deployed on top of existing hardware, CPU, GPU, in both data centers and edge devices to drastically improve deep learning speed, efficiency, and memory. But I want to try and simplify that topic today. So enough from me. Buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to Tel Aviv, Startup Nation, so we can speak with Dr. Eli David. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Thank you. Great to be here. So just a brief background. I'm Eli David, the co-founder of uh, Deep Cube. My background is for over 15 years in the field of neural networks, a field that nowadays we refer to as uh, deep learning. So neural network being the closest we've got in taking inspiration from our brain. I've been doing this since I was a young uh, master's and PhD student. Uh, so for the past 15 years, I've been uh, supervising PhDs and the uh, master's uh, degrees of my students, published over 50 papers uh, on the subject, wearing my academic hat. In parallel to that and in the industry, I co-founded previously Deep Instinct, a deep learning-based cybersecurity company, which is today one of the uh, prominent uh, cybersecurity companies in the world. And beginning 2018, co-founded the Deep Cube, and I would be happy to talk about that. Well, there's so many reasons I'm excited to get you on the podcast today. There is a lot of hype out there and software built on future promises, but you're really are a pioneering researcher in deep learning and neural networks, like you said, and you focus your research on the development of deep learning technologies that improve real world deployment of AI systems. But can I ask you to tell me more about that and why you believe that the key lies in software? So let me start from uh, giving you the reason why I even got into this field. It will summarize my belief about the current state and the future as well. So when I was doing my PhD 15 years ago, the field of neural networks was considered a refuted field of study. Nobody in his right mind would even touch this field. I went to this because it just felt natural to me. If we're trying to create artificial intelligence, so let's look at how the real intelligence looks like and try to mimic it, our brain, the neurons and the synapses, etc. And an anecdote to illustrate how, how much this field was considered refuted was when in 2006, uh, I went to the department chair at the university and told him, look, I would like to teach a course uh, entirely dedicated to neural networks. He checked with the teaching committee, came back and said they unanimously agreed that it is a stupid idea. Why would anyone teach neural networks? It has been refuted. But because we like you and we don't want you to leave the university after you finish your PhD, we agreed to approve the course with just one condition. Please don't call the course neural networks. Make up some other name. We don't want to put the university to shame. So I invented a different name. That was how neural networks were perceived uh, over 10 years ago. Later, 
What happened is a few years ago, due to a series of breakthroughs in both software and hardware, uh, we witnessed the greatest leap in performance in the history of AI due to neural networks. We managed to make them much bigger, much deeper. If 20 years ago we could train only neural networks of one or two or three layers, nowadays we can train neural nets of tens or hundreds of layers. And all the big breakthrough is actually due to this uh, size increase and the depth of the neural net. And hence the name deep learning, which is at the beginning, we called it deep neural networks, and then just decided that the brand deep learning is better than neural networks. So I believe that moving from now to the future, we will keep seeing, uh, keep witnessing this uh, accelerating pace of improvements and better results because uh, we managing to create bigger and deeper neural networks. And we can, of course, talk in much more detail about them. And like you said, you developed DeepCube, which for anyone listening, hearing about you for the first time, is a software-based inference accelerator that can be deployed on top of existing hardware in both data centers and edge devices to drastically improve deep learning speed, efficiency, and memory. But can you tell me a little bit more about that, expand on that, and the kind of problems that you set out to solve with DeepCube? So despite the great results due to deep learning in the past few years, and uh, uh, whenever you hear about the term the AI revolution, essentially it's the deep learning revolution. All the amazing results you see in computer vision, face recognition, medical image analysis, autonomous driving, speech recognition, language understanding, they're all due to deep learning. But the biggest problem with deep learning right now is that the models we train are big. Big in the sense that they take lots of memory, hundreds of megabytes to many gigabytes, and they are very computationally intensive. So after you train the, the model, you would like to deploy it in your appliance, in whether that's a data center or edge device, you need dedicated high-end processors, whether that's uh, GPUs or CPUs. And this impedes deployment. So today, when we talk about, when everyone talks about smart edge devices, they're far from that. They're just speakers and microphones. They record what you say, they send it to the cloud. There, all the deep learning processing is done and the result is sent back to your edge devices. This is very problematic for many different use cases. Imagine your edge device, your mobile, your camera, your drone, your uh, autonomous vehicle, you would like quick reaction times, that is low latency. You cannot wait for the data to go to the cloud and come back. Uh, what if you have um, high bandwidth of data, like video processing? You cannot effectively continuously upload the data to the cloud for prediction. What if you don't always have internet connection, like in drones or autonomous vehicles? What about the cost? If you're doing the processing in the cloud, it typically amounts to millions or even tens of millions of dollars uh, every month. And maybe one of the most important reasons, what about privacy? I'm not very happy that my so-called smart edge device continuously sends to the cl cloud all my sensitive information to do the processing and send the result back to me. So currently there is a big understanding that to bridge this gap between the amazing results on the research side and the real world deployment, there's a big gap to bridge it, we need to make deep learning models more efficient, uh, smaller as far as the memory is concerned, more computationally efficient so that we could put them actually on the edge devices themselves. And on the data center side, make them much faster, much less expensive. And that's what DeepCube has been doing. We started the company in early 2018. Currently, we are a team of uh, about 20 deep learning researchers and developers, uh, many of them my former masters and PhD students, essentially the best researchers I know in Israel. And what we have been doing through a series of breakthroughs, we have managed to make deep learning models much smaller, much sparser. The process is actually very similar to how our own brains work. We, we think about our brains that uh, when we are born, we're born with a certain brain size, and as we grow, our brain becomes bigger and bigger. And that's actually not true. We have the most number of connections in our brain, the synapses, 
when we are just two years old. And then from the age of two until late teenagehood, our brain is aggressively sparsifying the brain, removing redundant connections. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why it is so easy for us to learn new concepts like new languages when we are five years old or 10 years old, but somebody my age will have big difficulty learning a new language because our brain has lost the plasticity. So what DeepCube does is something very similar. During the training time of deep learning models, we aggressively sparsify the brain. We make it smaller without losing accuracy. So the end result is that for any deep learning model, whether that's for vision, speech, text, etc., we end up creating deep learning models that are typically over 10 times faster when you run them and over 10 times less memory intensive. So imagine you have a deep learning model that that consumes 500 megabytes, we turn it into under 50 megabytes. You have a system that's running deep learning at the speed of 10 frames per second, we turn it into 100 frames per second without sacrificing accuracy. And just to bring everything that you're talking about that there to life, do you have any real world examples or use cases that will just enable people listening wherever they are in the world to this podcast to, to understand just how DeepCube would, would work in their business and in their world? Certainly. So let me give you two real world examples, one on the edge device side and one on the data center. Uh, we're working with uh, a major uh, company on the edge devices, mobile devices specifically, and they would currently all their offering is based on image processing on the cloud. So for any image, they, they upload it to the cloud, perform the deep learning inference there, and the result is sent back to the mobile device. What we managed to do to take their deep learning model and make it over 10 times smaller, so they just about 25 megabytes, and they can put it on the mobile device itself. So the users, can enjoy the same benefit, the same processing with much faster reaction time instead of waiting a few seconds for the result. In a few milliseconds, they get the result and they can enjoy it even if they're in airplane mode, no connectivity, no privacy issues. It's all done on the edge device itself, something that could not have been done with the original deep learning model, which was over 300 megabytes. Another example on the data center, we're working with one of the major Fortune 500 companies, and they were contemplating upgrading uh, all their servers from CPUs to GPUs, graphics processing units, so that they could keep up with their inference processing uh, workloads. And that's something that would cost them millions of dollars of uh, upgrade. With DeepCube software, we allowed them to to do their current workload, which is recommendation systems. In, uh, imagine in retail, kind of processing to know which customer is interested in buying what product, et cetera. We managed to make their workload more than 10 times faster on their existing uh, infrastructure. So instead of them paying millions of dollars and replacing their hardware to another hardware, which is over 10 times faster, we allow them to get the same 10x improvement just using our software without modifying any hardware or not even modifying their operating system. And if we were to ask you to look into your virtual crystal ball and look a little bit further into the future, I've got to ask, I mean, how do you think that AI and deep learning can further enable software to reach its fullest potential? Because it seems incredibly exciting where we're heading, isn't it? It is definitely exciting. And uh, actually, I'm very excited, not because I'm looking at the current snapshot of where AI stands, that is in computer vision, speech recognition, very close to human level in language understanding, getting close. But even more than looking at the current snapshot is looking at the trajectory, the pace of improvements. So let me give you just an example of that. The largest neural network models in the 1980s they had just a few hundred connections, the synapses, the connections between the neurons. That's the, the typical measure of uh, neural network size, number of connections. So there are just a few hundreds. That was 1980s. 10 years ago, the largest neural nets had a few hundred thousand weights. 
Last year, the large, 2019, the largest neural network had about a billion weights. Today, in 2020, the largest one has over 200 billion weights. Mm -hmm. So you see the pace of improvement. It is not that uh, from year to year we improve a 2x or 5x. We're at a staggering uh, exponential trajectory. And if this pace continues, in a few years, we will be at a, a place where the largest neural networks will have um, tens or hundreds of trillions of weights. And as a side note, our brain's neocortex, the, uh, the analytical part of our brain, has a little over 100 trillion synapses. So we see that these artificial deep learning models are getting closer and closer to the computing capacity of our own brains. And it's just for each one of us to speculate what kind of results we can obtain when the computational power of our deep learning models would be the same as our own brains. Wow. Like you said, the speed of technological change is, uh, the pace that it's setting now is like a breathtaking speed. But I, I've got to ask, could, because there's so much hype in the industry at the moment, and you've got so much history in this area, are there any myths or misconceptions around AI and deep learning that frustrate you and you just like to finally lay to rest today? There is a big hype, and the hype is regarding the deployment of deep learning. Yeah. So you see amazing results and all of these results that you hear about in uh, computer vision speech recognition text understanding all of them the results are authentic they are true 90 percent or even 99 percent of these announcements you hear are correct but if 99 percent of these announcements are correct in the laboratory less than one percent of them find their way into a real world product due to this huge gap between the research and deployment. So most of these amazing results you hear about are correct, but they never leave the confinement of the laboratory. So if you look from a user's point of view, you don't benefit from the vast majority of them. So my hope and my expectation for the next few years is that we would see more and more of those results finding their way into actual end product. So that not 99% would remain in the laboratory, but at least 50% of them, 60% of them will find their way into the products that all of us are using on a day-to-day -day basis. And looking towards that future and that excitement place that we're heading, what kind of role do you expect DCube to play in that future? Is there, I know you appreciate you can't share too much about your future plans, but is there any, anything you can leave us with today? So when we started DeepCube in early 2018, nobody really cared about these problems of uh, deployment, the inference. Everyone was still excited about getting better and better results in the laboratory. Since 2018, uh, many things uh, as far as people's perception has changed. And today, when you talk to uh, the heads of many AI laboratories and the, the CIOs and CTOs of major companies, today they acknowledge that their biggest problem is not research, it's the deployment. So I'm happy that DeepCube was one of the pioneers in uh, doing that. And, uh, thankfully, due to that, we have a head start. We're offering already our customers a way to improve their inference. But now that the market has that awareness, we expect additional companies to have these good results. We hear about hardware developers that are more and more focused on this uh, edge deployment, uh, edge inference, data center inference uh, problems. So we expect uh, huge improvements uh, on the global scale in the next two to three years. And of course, we expect uh, that DeepCube would play a major part in that. Uh, but of course, we expect that more companies, software and hardware will play active role in this revolution of actually bringing AI to the end customers. And for anyone listening that would like to explore the future of deep learning and the great work that you're doing at DeepCube, what's the best way of continuing this conversation we started today or, or even just checking out um, your website and blogs and, and all the latest news that you guys are doing there? We would be happy for everyone to visit our, our website. We have uh, lots of information about what we do, the potential use cases, 
uh, examples of uh, uh, the, the use cases, both on the data center side and the edge devices side. And of course, we will be happy that they uh, send us an email through our website to start an interaction. And uh, we'll look forward to helping more and more customers bring their deep learning and AI from laboratory to actual deployment. Well, I've loved chatting with you today. It's so refreshing to get somebody on here as well. It's not just hyping up the latest technology, but like you said, deep at uh, DeepCube, you're focusing on research and development of deep learning technologies too to improve the real world deployment of AI systems. And it's in, invaluable work that you do, an incredibly exciting space to be a part of as well. But more than anything, just a big thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you very much, Neil. It was a pleasure. When I first heard about increasing the inference speed on a regular CPU to match and surpass that of a GPU costs several times more, and increasing inference speed on a GPU to equal the performance of 10 GPUs, I felt like Doc Brown in Back to the Future and found myself saying, Great Scott! <laughs> but that is why I record this Daily Tech podcast. So I cannot thank Dr. Eli David for coming on here today and talking about an incredibly complex subject in technology, but in a language that we can all understand. And I hope that you found this conversation as valuable as I did today. But as always, keep your insights, your questions coming over to me on today's on, on anything about today's episode or indeed anything at all. So please. Email me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk. And I've got a bit of a question for you before I sign off today, actually. My website is techblogwriter.co.uk, but I realise that can only rank here in the UK, and I've got international clients. So techblogwriter.com is now available, which I've purchased. Good times. What is the best way of using that, though? Because I don't want to lose any previous SEO from the .co.uk, what's the best way of doing it? If we have any SEO or website gurus that listen to this podcast, help. <laughs> I need a bit of advice from you. So thanks for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.